The Global Engagement Seminar Program is now situated here. My name is Jasmine Habib and I'm the director of the Global Engagement Seminar Program. This is the second annual summit. Sounds really good to say second, not first. Uh, so we've made it to the second year of the program and I'd like first to thank two people who've not yet really been fully recognized for all the work that they've done and that's Marcel O'Gorman and Ian Milligan. They were the two So last night, if you were here, of course, you got to meet them, so, sort of, kind of. Um, they were the seminar leaders. They were the instructors. They facilitated all of what you see, or what, what we could call the output or the outcome for um, today's summit. So they've led the students this far. They worked very closely with our fellows, and you'll get to meet them this afternoon as well. So really, um, deep, deep, deep appreciation for all of your work and I'm sure the students will have a whole lot more to say about that as well, but thank you very much for all of your efforts and for taking a chance um, in joining us in this experiment, this pilot program. Uh, I also have the pleasure to thank both Eve Beauchamp and Landon Pearson, both of whom are here again with us this year. They are two of the advisory council members for the Global Engagement Program. This really is a team effort. If, if ever you were to understand what team efforts are about, this program really is all about that. So the two um, have advised us on things like uh, who we might select as fellows, the kinds of programming that we'd like to do, and they've been incredibly supportive, very engaged um, as advisory council members. They're not just listed um, at the back of some form uh, for all to see. So I'd like to thank them also for traveling here with us and for engaging with all of us and particularly with our students. So thank you to Ev and to Landon. Okay, so last but not least, I'm here to introduce one of our two Yaroslavsky Fellows for the year. Every year we select one or two fellows to facilitate, uh, to act as the expert or practitioners for the students for the Global Seminar Program. And this year we have David Jones. I'm going to read very briefly here because he's got some things he'd like to share with you on his own. So David Jones is an executive producer and principal program manager on Microsoft's envisioning team. He explores how new technologies will impact the way we live and work in five to 10 years and brings ideas to life through experiential prototypes and video. A 25 plus year veteran of the computer industry, David has a rich background in strategic foresight, human centered design and product development. His past projects include Microsoft Excel, the tablet PC and Microsoft's envisioning center. Outside of work, David works with, sorry, outside of work, David works with nonprofits in the arts, education, and human rights spaces to leverage technology for social impact. He's also a certified alpine ski instructor. So with that, I welcome you to Waterloo. Thank you, Jasmine, and thank you everyone. Uh, it's uh, truly a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, I graduated from the University of Waterloo 26 years ago with a degree in electrical engineering, and this is my first time back in over 20 years, and so it's been amazing to see the changes and how much the place has grown. Uh, it's also great to reconnect with old friends, and also it's wonderful to finally meet the students in person. We've been sort of Skyping or Zooming, whatever you call it, using technology to, to engage in long distance learning, but it's great to finally get that face-to-face -face interaction and also just see the great work they've done in their projects. Um, so to start today, I figured I'd talk a little bit about what I do at Microsoft, because people always come up and ask me, like, what is envisioning exactly? And it's really a unique role that I don't know if it's done anywhere else. Um, and so basically, as you heard, I basically, um, I work on a small multidisciplinary design team that has a charter to think broadly about the future of work. Uh, and we do this through the lens of hu human-centered design. And so we try to put human needs first as opposed to the needs of, of the business. Um, and then what does this really involve? Well, it starts with uh, basically just ingesting all the research that's happening in the space. So we look at global trends. Don't worry about the slides, this is just to illustrate the point. Um, business trends, social trends, technical trends, uh, all of this just goes in the hopper and trying to make sense of it all. Then we go out into the world and we do our own research. Uh, we talk to both uh, you know, end users, but also um, experts in different fields. Uh, people like army generals, we'll talk to CEOs, we'll talk to researchers, uh, artists, psychologists, anthropologists. 
uh, and hear their stories and see what they're seeing uh, about the world and see and get their unique perspectives on, on what's changing and why. And then we sort of synthesize all this into some sort of framework that explains what's going on. We tend to look for like, what are the big shifts that are happening? And I just found this graphic online last week, the World Economic F uh, Forum just posted it, but it's the exact same thing that we've been talking about for the past four years. So I look at that as a sign of success that other people are starting to share the same ideas. Um, and for that, that's a, step, a starting point for us. So we come up with these hypotheses about what's changing in the world and why. And then we ask, so what? What does it mean? What does it mean for the way that we work? And at this point, we go and we build what we call experiential prototypes. Like maybe, you know, we'll, this example, we're talking about the future of meetings. And so we'll partner with a company like Skype and say, hey, what do we think the future of meetings is about? Uh, and we'll go explore some ideas and build a future meeting room. And we'll put technology in that that we think will be possible within five to 10 years to support the meeting. And then we'll bring our customers and partners through this experience to get their feedback. And we learn from these discussions. And the idea is really not to design the perfect meeting room, but to really further our understanding of what's important and what are the right questions we should be asking about meetings. So in this case, uh, we th we're thinking about how do we make meetings more participatory, or how do we increase the emotional bandwidth between remote and local participants. And so we repeat this in multiple different areas. We also look at uh, collaboration and small team brainstorming. Uh, we look at uh, storytelling with data, 2D, 3D, also in holographic form. Uh, we're exploring, you know, if we all were to work in virtual spaces, w what would you do? Would that be useful? Would it be horrible? Let's just build it and try. And, um, and then along the way, we occasionally package up our learnings and share them in the form of videos. Here's a series of, of documentary videos we made a couple years ago called The Changing World of Work. I've, I'll send a link to the end. Uh, this is actually, I think, where the WEF got their, their graphic from. Um, we also occasionally will make these uh, vision videos that package up all these ideas and tell the story of the day in the life of or the, d the day in a month of that try and bring all of these different ideas to life in a holistic sense. And I'll share one of these with you a little later today. Um, but the reason we do this is not to try to predict the future. Really, for us, it's about provoking these thoughtful conversations. And this is a, a photo we took just from one of our regular meetings where our CEO comes over to our space and engages with us in these conversations about, in this case, we're talking about the consumer market, what are the unmet needs, what are people seeking in life? We did this global study around what's, you know, what's missing. Um, and, and that's why we do it. It's to, we, we sometimes call it question farming. We, we're trying to grow better questions. And so, if, you know, based on the questions you ask, that determines what solution you build. And so that's the role we're playing here. It's really just trying to nurture and encourage these discussions, which in some ways is aligns perfectly with, with the philosophy of this course as well. We're really trying to get people engaged and asking better questions about the impact of AI. So with that, let's turn to AI and the future of work. Uh, it's a big topic, but I figure I'd start by just getting on the same page about what is AI. Uh, as we learned in class, there's a lot of disinformation out there. Uh, we all saw this headline from Newsweek about Stephen Hawking saying AI is going to destroy human civilization. Uh, no, that's not going to happen. Well, it depends on what you refer to destroy and what you mean by civilization. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, in, in this case, he's basically misquoted. What he really said is that, hey, so AI, strong AI is this notion that of uh, AI that can do everything a human can do. And then narrow AI is more of the, the AI we know how to do, which is it can solve specific problems. Nobody knows if we can build a strong AI or a general AI. Uh, and basically, that's what uh, Stephen Hawking says. We just don't know. I've highlighted the important bit there. Uh, but what we do know is that narrow AI does work. And we've made tremendous progress in that field over the past decade. So what is um, narrow AI? I'll, I'll just a couple slightly technical s slides here just to sort of set a baseline of understanding. So the term AI was first coined in the 50s, and it was it meant to, to cover everything that uh, people could do that computers couldn't do. So that was things like uh, computer vision, uh, understanding natural language, speech recognition, uh, planning, reasoning, learning, stuff like that. And so one of the sub areas of, of AI is machine learning. And machine learning is simply uh, computer algorithms that can learn from statistical patterns and data. And what they do is they build a model from those patterns that can be used to then make predictions, like, is this a picture of a cat? Yes or no. Is this Dave? Yes or no. Will this person repay a loan? Yes or no. Um, and that's, that's all it does. It's just very good at, at sort of doing predictive uh, pattern analysis like that. And then deep learning is a specific type of machine learning. Um, and that's because it uses 
uh, it's, it's built on deep artificial neural networks, and, and neural networks are based on, loosely on the architecture of the brain. So uh, let me just dig into um, deep learning a little more for a moment. So artificial neural networks are basically, uh, on the right here, or sorry, on the left we have biological neurons. You all know that's what your brain is made of, the brain cells. Um, they receive inputs along the dendrites. There's some threshold that's exceeded, and then it fires a signal along the axon, which goes out to other uh, neurons. Uh, and on the left, on the right here, we have just the digital equivalent. And so that's an artificial neuron. And when you wire a bunch of these up together, you end up with a neural network. Um, there's two neural networks here. The one on the left is a simple neural network. You see the red dots, those are inputs. You see the blue dots, those are outputs. And the yellow dots are simply called um, hidden layers. And a deep neural network simply has lots of yellow dots, lots of hidden layers. That's it. So the, the, the term deep is sometimes confusing because when it's applied to human intelligence, it implies, you know, deep thought, like philosophers or deep Socrates, Plato, that sort of thing. But no, when applied to machine learning, it's really an architectural attribute. It's deep in the sense that a swimming pool has a deep end or an underground parking garage might be really deep and have many levels. Um, so that's a deep learning. There's really no uh, mystery there. Um, one of the interesting attributes about deep learning, so deep learning's actually been around since the 80s, possibly even the 70s. Um, but as you can see from this chart here, the blue line represents sort of deep learning per performance based on the amount of data you have. If you don't have a lot of data, it doesn't work very well. And so most of the industry had basically written off deep learning as just not working well enough. But there was a couple of folks who, who kept investing in it here in Canada. They got grants from the Canadian government. And then once the world caught up, we got more data, we got cloud computing. We now have the technical ability to, to train those algorithms to the point where they can now perform at human or greater ability. And that's what all the excitement is about deep learning today is we finally have a machine learning technique that actually works. Um, there was a question last night about, you know, how has AI changed over the course of your career? I actually have a chart that shows exactly that. Um, this is from Microsoft Research. It's um, speech recognition word error rates, so the error rate of doing speech recognition. I started at Microsoft in 93, and so from 93 all the way to about 2010, you can see that uh, the speech error rates weren't improving very quickly. There's no good y-axis here, but that dashed line represents human level understanding. And so for most of my career, people kept trying to project those curves down, saying one day it'll be good enough, and it never was. But along comes deep learning in about 2011, that's the blue line, and now you can see the error rates just plummet, and now we're at better than human level accuracy. And this is the same dynamic that's playing over and over again in any application where we're using deep learning. You get enough data, you have enough compute power, you can perform a task better than humans can. And so as a result, we're seeing headlines like this. AI is gonna transform the economy, it'll transform medicine, it'll transform agriculture, it's even gonna transform municipal waste sorting. There's really nothing AI can't do, provided you have the right data and you, know, you can define the task that it can be done in a repetitive manner. So let's, I wanna, in order to sort of wrap our brains around this, I wanna give you some specific examples of deep learning so you can get a sense for what can be done. Um, how many people here grew up watching Star Trek? Yes, lots of hands. Wasn't it interesting how they could always go to some foreign planet and be able to talk to the aliens in English? That's because they had this thing called universal translation, the idea that you could translate in real time from one language to another. When I worked in research, this was considered on our list of impossible problems, things that we had no idea how to solve, but if they did, they could change the world. Well, guess what? We shipped it last year. Um, we can now do real-time translation um, in, in a whole bunch of different languages. And for the ones we can't do yet, it's really just a data gathering problem. Um, and at CES this year, uh, there's even companies from Shenzhen that are selling these little earpieces that can do real-time translation between English and Chinese. Uh, you know, this, we've gone from science fiction to like you can buy it now in a store, uh, you know, in a matter of, you know, sh short number of years. Um, another example you've probably heard of, uh, you heard, remember when uh, Deep Blue, IBM's computer, beat Gary Kasparov in chess? That was considered not really machine learning because they used a br brute force technique of just pre-calculating all the chess moves. And the game, the Chinese game of Go, which has the little uh, black and, and white stones that you turn over, Othello, I think, was the, the, the Fisher Price version or whatever here in, in Canada. Um, but it was considered a much harder game for computers to play because there's so many possible board positions. Apparently there's more than atoms in the universe or something. So you couldn't brute force a solution. 
well, three, you, three years ago, a company called uh, DeepMind, right? Uh, yes, that Google bought, um, trained up an algorithm using deep learning, and they beat Lisa Dahl, who was the, the reigning champion at the time. Uh, what's even more interesting, though, is now the, the same company is continuing to invest in their, in their game playing technology. They now use a technique called reinforcement learning, where they basically have the computer play against itself to learn how to play. Instead of learning from human games that have already been played, they teach it the 14 rules and they say, go. And in three days, it was able to become a better Go player than the machine that beat Lisa Dole. And then it didn't stop then. Now they've, and you can read the text there, they've apparently trained it for up to 40 days. But we don't even have the vocabulary to describe how much smarter that is than human level. That's just an example of the power and the speed with which uh, machine algorithms can learn. Uh, here's a slightly scarier example. I don't know if you've heard about ch the Chinese Safe Cities Initiative where uh, they want to build a database of faces where they can recognize anyone in China anywhere within three seconds. Uh, this should be setting off privacy alarm bells, perhaps, and, and concerns about you know, big brother type society. But this is no longer a science fiction scenario. We now have the technology to do this, uh, which is why you know, there's been calls for regulation, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, it's not all scary scenarios, though. There's a lot of uh, potential upside as well, especially if you consider the, the amount of medical data that exists in silos and, and in various form. Uh, computers are really good at uh, doing image analysis. Uh, we can detect eye diseases faster, cheaper, more lively than humans, uh, breast cancer, uh, all sorts of radiology scenarios. This is just the beginning. There's so much upside in terms of providing better, faster, cheaper medical care, earlier detection, more accurate detection, uh, and all of this is no longer science fiction. It's just a, ma just a matter of gathering up the data, training it, testing it. Lots of hard work, but um, the, the productivity benefits of that are, are now within sight. I also want to share with you a very small example, and this is one of my favorites. This is um, from a, a researcher I used to work with. Uh, he's a machine learning researcher, and uh, he's married, and his wife likes to garden, and they have a cat. And one day he came home, and their neighbor's cat got into their garden and ate their flowers. And his wife was furious, and she's like, honey, you have to do something about this. Um, and so being an introverted computer science researcher, he took some photos of his cat, he took some photos of his neighbor's cat, he trained up a convolutional neural net to recognize the difference between them, he hooked it up to a webcam and to a sprinkler system, and now whenever his neighbor's cat goes into the yard, the sprinkler system turns on. Uh, but it doesn't if his own cat goes in there. And I love this example because it's just incredibly geeky and it's sort of like uh, symbolic of the world I live in sometimes. But it's, it's great of like AI doesn't have to solve these giant problems. It can solve really small problems too. Everything we do can become smarter. And I like to think back to you know, the, the turn of the century, the 1900s where electrical motors are being rolled out. And I'm sure somebody was saying like, some days you'll be using a motor to brush your teeth or to shave in the morning and people probably laughed at this person. Uh, what a ridiculous thought of having an electrical motor in your toothbrush. But, you know, sure enough, um, many people use them today and they're actually better for your gums, apparently. My dad was a dentist. Um, so anyway, just, you know, there's all these different, you know, really, there's almost unlimited scenarios that we can apply AI, and this is what's getting folks excited. And in recognition of this potential, I don't know if you heard the news, but last week, uh, three of the, the scientists who were involved were awarded the Turing Prize, which is like the Nobel Prize of computer science. And uh, Joshua Bengio is associated with the University of Montreal. Uh, Jeff Hinton is with University of Toronto. And you know, they credit the C Canadian government for funding their research in deep learning when everyone else had written it off. So Canada has, play, has played a pivotal role in the development of this technology. So go Canada. And Jan Lecun, he's the lead AI guy at Facebook right now. So of course, as we've talked about over the past day, uh, AI is not without its problems. Uh, when you have training algorithms that learn from data, we've learned that data represents the real world. The real world is messy. It contains our biases, our prejudices, our opinions, how you collect the data matters, who you collect it from matters. Uh, there's a lot of potential problems here. And, uh, you know, there's, there's no shortage of, of alarming scenarios. One of the most common ones is that, you know, early facial recognition did a poorer job of recognizing folks with darker skin tones. Um, and then especially when you consider that in the context of maybe self-driving cars, using that to recognize pedestrians, you realize, wait a minute, this could be not very good. Um, the good news is that these are, these are problems are solvable. 
Um, it's just a matter of rolling up your sleeves, collecting more data, being sort of thoughtful about, um, you know, where it, how the technology is going to be used and so forth. Uh, but other examples, you know, everyone's probably heard of the Amazon attempt to see if they could predict whether people applying for jobs would succeed. And the algorithm picked up on the fact that they don't have a lot of women in technology. And so anyone who, any time the AI could pick up that someone was a, a woman, it would assume they wouldn't succeed. So fortunately they can that. Um, but again, as, you know, going back to the conversation last night, you know, AI is going to reflect the biases that exist in society today. And, 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 and I think that's a good thing, but now we have to take action to address them. Um, as I said, it's a good thing we are making progress. Uh, Microsoft got, you know, was in the spotlight for our, our, the shortcomings of our facial recognition software. We put a lot of effort in making sure we had uh, inclusive data sets. Now we can boast one of the, probably the best or most inclusive, most fair um, algorithm on the market. Uh, but what but that exercise taught us is that we, you need to actually do the work. And, there's, and, and we can't, we need regulation around that. Otherwise, we get into this sort of ethical race to the bottom where people are going to be pushing out things faster in order to, to grab market share. Um, and so, yeah, we're calling for regulation of facial recognition. Uh, we now have an eth ethics board inside the company that looks at all the various scenarios. And in many cases, we've declined to sell the technology to certain organizations because we don't believe what they're doing with it is in the best interest of society. Um, and I think going forward, we're going to look at having external ethics review boards as well. I mean, again, this came up in our discussions last night. Everyone's saying like, hey, we need to start drawing these lines and so we all play by the same rules. So there's a lot of opportunity here to, for some thoughtful investigation on what these rules should be. So let's switch gears and talk a little bit about the impact of AI on the economy. Uh, the, the research here has been done largely by the big um, consulting firms, Bain, McKinsey, and PwC. And I'm going to steal this, uh, this, the cover slide from the PwC report because it really summarizes everything I want to talk about. If you look over on the left here, you know, there's expected to be a large productivity boom from AI, uh, roughly to the tune of, of $15 trillion over the next roughly 10 years. That's, you know, productivity goodness, yay. Um, however, it is going to potentially impact jobs in a significant way. Um, early 2020s, they see maybe 3% of jobs at risk, but then as we start to roll out these new AI-based services, you know, by mid-2030s, they're looking at maybe 30% of the jobs at risk, and then up to 44% for folks of, who have uh, low education and have jobs particularly susceptible to automation, like, you know, uh, automobile or truck drivers, cashiers, clerks, and so forth. And when you look at the number of people in those professions, uh, you realize why some of these statistics are alarming. Because there's a lot of people that will need to find new jobs. Um, here's another chart from that same report that simply shows the different waves of, of whether it's displacement or just change happening. Um, so we're, we're good for about 15 years, and then we're going to have to really start, um, we have to make sure we're prepared for this, basically. This is a controversial issue. Um, I think I just got the, this was like from April 2nd, Wall Street Journal. There's lots of people weighing in saying, no, 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 AI is going to create jobs. No, it's going to destroy jobs. No, no, it's not jobs. It replaced tasks. And so our jobs are going to change. I think the truth is that, that these are all true statements. Uh, and that AI has the potential just to transform the way we work, what we do. And in some cases, it'll eliminate certain industries. In some cases, it will create entirely new ones. Um, but uh, when faced with all this sort of conflicting information uh, coming from an area that's not my area of expertise, what I like to do is look for who's the smartest person I know whose opinion I would trust. And in this case, um, I, I turned to a researcher named Kai Fu Li. Kai Fu Li is a machine a science researcher. He, he wrote a book earlier this year called AI Superpowers. Um, he was, I think he made the first continuous speech recognizer as part of his PhD thesis. And he's worked at Apple, he's worked at SGI, he worked at Microsoft where I met him, um, where he founded Microsoft Research in Beijing, which is no small feat. Then he went on to Google and became the president of Google China, Other, again, not a small job. And now he runs a VC firm investing in AI startups out of Beijing. So he knows a little about AI, and he came out with a pretty strong statement earlier this year saying within 50 years, he thinks between 40 to 50% of the jobs in the US will be replaceable by automation. Um, now of course, it may take longer for, this, for the jobs to actually change, but the technical capability will be there. And so even if he's wrong by 50%, we're still looking at a pretty enormous social impact of these changes. And so it's important that we uh, start to prepare people for them and put in place the right social programs and training programs so that it's not uh, a painful transition. 
Uh, Bain also did an analysis of you know, how fast this would occur, and they concluded that it's basically you know, two to three times faster than the, last, the, the previous big transitions. For example, the transition the industry took from agriculture to industrial um, at the turn of the 19th century, or 20th century. So yeah, this is, it's gonna happen fast and it's gonna be large. So let's talk now about um, the jobs that people will have. And this is where I get into sort of the work that I do. We look at what is it that people are gonna do and how can technology help us do those jobs better, faster, in a more enjoyable way with better results. So we focus really on human activities. And we, we break the human skills that humans, that, that computers are not, we don't think are gonna be able to do into basically roughly three categories. At the top left here, we have uh, social skills or collaboration, right? It's all about human interaction. So listening, understanding, communication, uh, building trust, empathy, that sort of thing. And I think we talked about that over the past day as well. I mean, th there's so many roles involve a human contact, we're social creatures, that's not gonna go away. On the, on the left-hand side, we have critical thinking skills. This is really all about human judgment. Uh, so, because machines will never have all the data, right? There's always gonna be other things that only humans understand, relationships and so forth. And so this is you know, critical thinking, uh, computational thinking, you have to understand how to work with the tools that exist, data-driven deci data decisions, that sort of stuff. All the sort of rolls up into sort of human judgment and decision making. And then last but not least below, we have what we call creative skills. And we think of creative skills as just non-routine skills. So for automating all the routine work, what's left becomes non-routine. And so it's more ambiguous. There's more problem solving. There's more uh, iteration. There's more failure and iterating, persevering, that sort of thing. And all of these sort of blend together at some level. But these are the three sort of categories that we think about in our work. Um, some of the students may recognize this slide a bit. I stole it from my first presentation. But when I, you saw it the first time, we were talking in terms of our vision for the role technology plays. And if you, um, if I just overlay it, you know, where we talked about collaboration, we ask, what do we want technology to do? Well, we want us to help bring people together. When we talk about critical thinking, what do we want technology to do? Well, we want to help us make better decisions. So how do we work smarter? How do we live smarter? And then for creativity, how can technology help us get into creative flow? Where it just gets, sometimes just getting out of the way and let us focus on what we're trying to do. Um, and so that's what drives, this is the scaffolding we use to drive our explorations around different concepts. So let me give you some examples because this gets pretty abstract. Um, you know, it's just in simply in terms of uh, supporting relationships, bring people together. Uh, this is a prototype of a, uh, what we call a um, auto stereoscopic 3D display where it feels like you're talking to the other person as if they're in the same room. It's just like it's on the other side of a screen, but it's life size. It feels like they're sitting in the room with you. In this case, this woman's talking to her dad and he's sharing data from his new knee implant and he's, you know, it's doing really well. Um, in a work context, um, here's a woman who's appearing as an avatar on a, on a digital whiteboard or blackboard um, where she has the ability to interact with the data and explain things to people. So they may know her, the fact that she may not be uh, you know, fully rendered in, in photorealistic uh, style doesn't matter. It really, it's about explaining the problem, getting them engaged. We also think that with computers able to see our world and understand what we say, the interfaces are going to change. We're going to see a lot more uh, speech interfaces. And in this case, this is uh, something we call an augmented conversation. So you can imagine this woman's having a, a phone, she's on a phone call, you can see her earpiece up there but we're displaying the phone call as if it was a chat transcript. And she has a digital assistant that's bringing her the content that they talk about, and so it's an augmented conversation. So when you refer to things that you might be working on together, it just appears, and you can point to it, and you both see the same thing. We also think that because we're going to be investing in all these data flows, because they're the fuel for all these AI algorithms, that humans are gonna wanna work with this data as well. So we're looking at what are the new tools that humans will use to, to mine this data, to, to extract patterns, to find anomalies, to answer questions. And in this case, uh, uh, this woman, Kat, is working with a, uh, a simulation where you're able to sort of interact with a hologram naturally and, and modify the, the size and shape of this 3D ocean farm to, to achieve certain goals. And don't worry, I'll bring all this stuff to life in a moment. 
And then the last scenario I'll show you here, um, we also think that there's an opportunity for AI to help people find jobs. This is why Microsoft bought LinkedIn. Um, you guys are all, have all these skills, all these interests. Companies have all these people they want to hire. And it's a really messy process to figure out who talks to who and who fits where. It's sort of a great thing if AI could actually potentially recommend people for positions. But not only that, maybe you don't quite qualify for a position, but you really like that position. Well, then we can recommend a project or a course or something to fill that skill gap. And so we think there's a really interesting opportunity for AI help people learn the skills they need to pursue the interests they have. So that's something we're thinking about well as well. Um, the name for this I just learned, uh, we've been watching this for a while, but it hasn't really come up with a name until recently, and it's called the human cloud. It's basically all these people out there looking to contribute in some ways, and the idea is can technology mediate those, those transactions? Right now, it's dominated by the ride-sharing platforms, so Lyft and Uber. So when you see stats like revenue up 65 year of human cloud, that's really just people getting rides. Uh, but we think this is going to generalize to other industries as well. Uh, and it sort of overlaps nicely with the gig economy where you know almost 30% of workers now have these alternate arrangements where they're not necessarily working full time. So I see, I just saw somebody yawn. I, this stuff can get mind numbing after a while, which is why we, um, switch over to storytelling to engage people uh, in these uh, ideas because it, it allows you to sort of connect all the dots between all these ideas and imagine what it might be like. So with that, I'd like to introduce um, a short video. The students have seen it, but hopefully they don't mind watching it one more time. Um, there's two characters in the video. There's Kat on the left. She is a 20-something millennial representative of the students in the class. She studied marine biology. Uh, she's working part-time jobs and uh, she does volunteer as well. And then on the, the right-hand side, we have Lola. She's more Gen X, maybe baby boomer. She's at the end of her career. Uh, she still wants to stay engaged and work part-time. Uh, she wants to make a difference in the world. And so what she does is she assembles these teams of people together to go and refurbish all of these coal and gas-powered uh, power plants uh, that are no longer economically viable because the cost of renewable energy is just about to cross beneath the cost where it's cheaper to build new solar and, and wind power than it is to, ri to run the old plants. And so they're now turning these old plants into uh, bioprocessing facilities for biomass coming from 3D ocean farms. We try to weave in all these different uh, scenarios to tell an inspiring story. So with that, I'll run the video and I'll, I'll try and lightly. And the story is about how Kat and Lola meet and work together on the project. Music? Music. Okay, so Kat's got a holographic um, display built to her mask. You can project the wire around your sample kit, and she's taking samples of the kit. Getting content with wildlife from Jesus. Here she's having a translated conversation about a scene in a movie. These are all AI based scripts and all the music. As we pull back, she's actually talking to a, a mute girl who's using sign language to communicate with her. She's learning about all the kids are, are sort of following their curiosity to learn about this topic. These kids are 3D printers of the sea life. These kids are artistic, so the sketch can help. These kids are analyzing the samples you took and thinking of the molecular structure. These kids are actually just looking at the, um, the dive footage and checking out the sea life they saw. They want to learn more about the, uh, the ray, and so the teacher's going to come over and support their, their, their learning journey by sharing a module they can do. Now Kat's going to go uh, grab some lunch. Can you volume up a bit? This is her, her device. It's contextually aware. So it knows she's in the cafe and brings up the menu for her to recommend what she might want to get. It's also got a screen on the other side. This is what we call a contextual feed. It sort of prioritizes all the incoming requests. Just kind of pay attention to what happened. This is a digital workspace that we're designing to help people work, work together collaboratively on partnership with AI-based services. service that will actually take all of this content and turn it into a nicely formatted report. This is something we recently shipped in PowerPoint called Designer. She wants it to be a little simpler than this, so she's giving it some input to make it shorter. Now she 
publishes it, and this is how Lola finds her. And of course, a human still brings her her tea. It's still a nice human moment. So here's Lola getting into work. She's got an earpiece. I'm going to take a call in a moment. She's going to transfer this call onto a transparent screen. This is where we have that augmented conversation, the things they're talking about get uh, augmented visually. Now she's going to ask her digital assistant to help her find a candidate for this open spot. She can visualize her LinkedIn graph for qualified candidates. And she pulls out a couple to compare. So she compares their skill profile, their experience, to their network influence. And she pulls down Cat's document. Now this can be a smart document with AI services baked in that can actually help her understand what Cat what, what, um, has been doing. So she can interact with it, ask questions. So now we got Kat who's on out with her friends for end of the town. She's wearing this uh, digital wearable that she can personalize to match her outfit. She can also snap the pieces together to get a larger screen. Her digital assistant's letting her know that Lola wants to talk to her and is recommending that she accept this because this is important. It also helps her book a co-working space. And she's using um, muscle uh, inputs from her arm to drive the UI. that authenticates her at the door. And she, she can transfer the context from the bracelet to this shared workspace in a secure way. And she puts in her biometric sensing earbuds, which can then measure her psychological state, and which can affect the UI as well. So here she's asking the system to bring in her notes on a particular topic. This is a contextual search. But not only can it bring you content, it can also connect you with the people you know who might have the answer to the question. Of course, once it senses that she's getting in a state of flow, the earpiece turns orange, we quiet down the UI, and we try not to disturb her because she's clearly getting work done. She's in that state of creative flow we talked about. So now we see Lola's feed, that Kat has joined her team. She's going to celebrate by having a smoothie. Um, the, kitchen, the kitchen computer can sense that and add her tracker calories automatically. Now she's talking to her dad. This is the auto stereoscopic 3D display. They live in different cities, but they have a chat daily, and it maintains that close relationship. She's really proud that her dad's remaining so healthy. Now we see Kat coming to work with her new team. They're going to rehydrate this problem they're working on on the digital blackboard. It supports working shoulder to shoulder, using touch, using voice, using pen, using uh, personal devices to solve these complex uh, metabolic pathway problems. Now we see Lola appearing as an avatar. She wants to share some new information with them. They have a new order coming in from South America. The systems recognizes that they're struggling here, brings them some of the data on their yield. They match the data up, realize they don't have enough kelp to submit the order. The cat's like, don't worry guys, I got this. I'm the kelp expert. So she brings up a model of the 3D kelp farm. That's a hologram. She can interact with it directly. This is, of course, HoloLens enables this. And she can use her ability to visualize the nutrient currents in the ocean to optimize or to maximize the amount of kelp they get. So a couple of months later, the fisherman fires off some underwater drones. Of course, this is all AI driven. They swarm through the kelp field, measuring the kelp yield. This provides them with real-time analytics that allows them to make firm commitments to the customer. The team's happy because everything was working. Cat's getting new, more interesting job offers. She's excited because her career is progressing in a way that she makes her happy and she knows that her work is making the world a better place. So I know that's a lot to absorb in six minutes. Normally I use this at the beginning of a day of maybe a day or two day long workshop to dig into ideas. But hopefully I was able to bring some of these ideas alive uh, and connect them together in some unexpected way. So I think I'm almost out of time. So I really just want to leave you with two thoughts uh, before we go to Q&A. Um, the first one is a quote from our CEO, Satya Nadella, about AI. And he points out that it could be the most fundamental technology the human race has ever created. Um, and it, there's really that much potential. I mean, it, it can be applied at almost any scale. You can learn things quickly. Uh, it has, you know, near marginal uh, cost. Uh, you know, to create a, a second one doesn't cost any more than the first one type of thing. And so it really could potentially uh, help us solve problems that today are un even unimaginable how we would solve them, but also form the basis of a completely new way of, of, of society operating. And then that leads me to my, my other 
comment, which is really just a question, is you know, what kind of future do we want to build with AI? Uh, do we want to use it to dehumanize people, to oppress people? Uh, where's Killer Robot? Uh, where's Bronca? You know, to kill one another because it will do that very well. Or do we want to use it to invest in humans, to, to help us work together, to help us to learn and grow, and to, you know, to create a society where we, every single person has the opportunity to, to contribute in a meaningful way and earn a dignified living? So maybe I'll leave the answer to that for Q&A. But uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for the opportunity to be involved in this amazing program. And uh, I look forward to continuing the discussion. One last thing, I'll throw my contact information up here in case anyone wants to chat offline. Yes, should I just do Q&A? Yeah. Or yeah, do you want? Yeah, down on the front here. So if you can come forward to one chair, there's one chair. I can't see any clocks. Let me know when I need me to okay. cut it off. I just have a question about this credibility and uh, cre creativity. And yes. uh, I know there is some, the AI, like a drawing this artwork and actually was sold at quite a relatively high price. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you mentioned about those, the things that AI isn't the easy to replace on, one is the creativity. Mm -hmm. So what's your thoughts about like uh, even this kind of the artwork is drawn by the AI? So the, the, those are called generative AIs, and I think the, the technology is generally as generative adversarial networks, where you have two AIs, one which is generating errors, and the other one is discriminating, and then you just let that go and see where it ends up. Um, but it's largely still learning from existing work. Um, and I think the reason that, I mean, I'm, I'm not an artist, but I would guess that the first AI-generated painting that looks okay probably is of some value because it's the first. Uh, does it mean that everyone wants to buy AI-generated art? I don't know, because I think at some level art is about human meaning, and I think the human meaning there is that it's the first one. Um, but it's, it's a great question. We don't know what the limits are right now, but as of now, like, I don't see AI uh, generating, doing creativity in the sense that where you're working on undefined problems. It's really just generating options, and then you have to choose amongst those options. Um, if I'm hedging my bets here, I'm thinking about some of the other recent applications of generative AI, which is around, let's say, physics, where you expose uh, algorithms to all of the physics data and you see if they can derive sort of models that explain from that. Is that creativity? I don't know. It's science, so maybe not. But I, the answer is really we don't know. But right now, it doesn't look like uh, the, the creative skills are, are going to be um, eliminated by AI. Okay. Thank you. Go for it. So, um, it looked very interesting when you talked about automating all the, you know, the small tasks that we don't really like doing out of these jobs. Is there a concern about overproductivity? I.e., that like the oftentimes the hardest job. I'm a science person, and the hardest part of my job is the creative element of my work, solving new problems. And at some point, you just like need to go and do something menial for a bit mm. because like I can't be creative for yep. more than like an hour and a half a day. Yep. And then yeah. so, I mean, I get one yes. breakthrough a week. Yeah, yeah. And if my job is only breakthroughs, I just yeah, yeah. can't do that. Can I? Yes, absolutely. So what we find in our research is a lot of the menial tasks, you know, the, the so-called shit work, whatever. People find it very comforting. Uh, you know, Monday morning, you can't just come in and be maximally creative. You want to go and it's like, okay, now we'll do the expense report. You're warming up. You know, you have to get into that zone. Same thing on Friday afternoon. Some people like to do like predictable, where it makes you feel like you're getting stuff done. Uh, so yes, it is a concern. Um, I also wonder though, you know, is the way we've structured the work week, we've optimized, the, the 40 hour work week was optimized for the industrial economy. What would a, a work week optimized for a creative economy look like? I think that actually might be a more interest because I don't want to, maybe I don't want to do the, the, the crap work. Um, maybe I just don't want to work at all. You know, maybe I'd rather be going for a walk or working out or whatever. And so I think that avenue of discussion that maybe we could be considering uh, different work arrangements may ultimately be more fruitful. So you'd suggest sort of a sort of work week changing our work culture to adjust for that or? I would love to, I mean, who wouldn't want to have three day weekends all the time? 
Yeah, you know, like why? So if, if, if automation is going to do more and more of the, of the repetitive work and it's hard to be creative all the time, maybe we should just work less. Thank you. Hey, David. Yes. Hey. Um, in the video that we were able to look at, uh, both in class and uh, just now, it's a lot of very advanced technologies from software and hardware perspectives. Do you see one of those two things more uh, progressed towards that kind of vision right now? And do you think that's going to in influence how the other develops to, uh, to match it? They're kind of developing hand in hand. I mean, the, the, probably the big advance you see there, which we had to be very careful when we first worked on the video because it was still secret, was the holographic interactions. Um, but the idea of mixed reality where you can put upon a pair of glasses and work with high resolution, uh, shared world blocked holograms in your physical space, that, that's real. And it's potentially transformative because it's, you know, it can, you can, you're no longer limited by the size of your screen uh, you can, and you can work with actual, you know, physical analogs of things. Does that answer your question? I mean, th that's one aspect of the hardware that, that's definitely advancing. I think now we, had, we should also fill the flexible display. Uh, I think there's a number of companies that are working on that technology right now. I'm not sure how uh, popular it's going to be. It might be more gimmicky than, but the idea that you can maybe unfold your tablet and have a much larger screen is appealing in some cases. Yep, it, w it was mostly just looking at, because uh, that's a view from within the company, Microsoft. Mm -hmm. In the industry is different. Uh, competitors or companies advance if they crack something like the foldable screen uh, early. The, do you find that um, the hardware advances are outpacing the software advances or is it the other way around? It's a good question. I think um, what I would say what happens is sometimes is one team will be overly focused on one and other, the, the, maybe the, the hardware team works on the hardware and they don't put enough energy into the software. And then what happens is the hardware comes out, but the software doesn't fully support it. And so people say, well, this doesn't work. Uh, really, both teams have to work side by side because when you change hardware form factors, the interaction model changes. And that has deep implications in the software model as well. So it, it's a challenge to, to do both well. And that's why I think Apple has done uh, so well with their devices is they've sort of kept that really high design bar where you know, Steve Jobs, when he was alive, was basically you know, an authoritarian in, in terms of making sure all aspects of the design worked really, really well together. You know, he's maniacal about the color and the feel and, and all that sort of stuff, where it's very easy in, in companies that don't have that kind of leadership to sort of have different silos working on things independently, and they don't quite come together nicely. Thank you. Hello, David. Hey. That was a very good presentation. Thank you for that. Um, so the video itself seems very positive, which I like, because it kind of turned my perspective towards how AI can really contribute to a better learning environment in the future. Um, but something that nags at the back of my head is from a book that I recently read called 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, and something discussed in there is once AI automates certain jobs, an entire working class might become irrelevant because they don't have- A useless have, class. Yeah, they might become a, a useless class, and at that point, we're not concerned about you know, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie and those kind of things. We're concerned with a group of people who don't have a relevant skill set to succeed in an automated mm. world. And I just wanted to know what your perspective on that would be and how we would encounter those challenges. Mm. That's a great question. Uh, it makes me question, like, what's the purpose of our economy and what are we driving towards? If it's all about sort of increasing GDP and minimizing cost of production, at some point if we put a large segment of the population out of work, has that really got us to a, a better place? Um, I think we have to uh, somehow establish or recognize that humans have value, sort of intrinsic value, and we need to invest in humans and create opportunities for humans to contribute in meaningful ways. Um, otherwise, they, they do uh, they do bad things. Like, you know, if you look at failed countries, they go into organized crime or, or religious fundamentalism. Um, people need a way to get productively engaged in their communities. And there's so much work that is done, care work, you know, elder care, child care, and so forth, that is so important that we underinvest in, um, and especially with aging populations. And so there's got to be some way where we can uh, change the system so that work is valued and then create opportunities for people to contribute in those ways. Because everything, everybody wants to contribute. And I think there's, if you look around at the state of the world, I think you'd say, yeah, there's still lots of work to be done. It's not perfect yet. Uh, and so how do we change the way we value things so that 
we have the right incentives in place for people to make those positive contributions. So when it all adds up, everybody gets to feel good about their lives and we don't destroy the environment in the process of people doing that. Do you think that a universal basic income might fit into that equation so people have more time and freedom to do the things that they feel called towards and have more of that creative humanistic outlet? It's a topic that keeps coming up. I know Silicon Valley folks like it. Um, I think it might, some form of that might be necessary, but I don't know if it's sufficient because I think people need, um, people need a sense of self-worth, right? They need to feel good about themselves and so they need a purpose, they need something to do. And just giving them money, they're, they're just as likely to go drink themselves to death um, as opposed to go volunteer. And so I think we need more social support to encourage people to do productive things with the money. Now, maybe that means uh, at some point that you do get some sort of basic income, but I think more needs to change than just getting a check every month. That's just my opinion, but I mean, there's a lot of people talking about this right now. It's a hot topic. Thank you. Hi, David, thank you for all that. I have two questions. One, <clears throat> uh, when you're doing all this research, do you also consider things like disruption? So what happens in the middle of uh, the connection between the person who's underwater and the person who's in Seattle? What happens when the technology doesn't work? And how do you think those problems through? And the other thing is, why the focus on the future of work and not the future of play? So maybe I'll take those in, in separate order. We actually talk about the future of play because we think play is the way that people learn as kids, and so we do focus a lot on that. If you come to the Envisioning Center, it's live, work, play is our, our tagline. Um, but I guess maybe the, 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 the boring practical answer is our customers are generally Fortune 1000 companies, and so we have to show uh, ideas that are relevant to them, that connects to them and helps further our relationship with them. Ultimately, this is where, yeah, we're part of a big company. Our goal is to make money. We want to make the world a better place too, but we have to align with you know, the interests of our, our customers and subtly move them down the road of, of having more positive impact on the world. Um, uh, the first question was, do we think about what goes wrong? All the time, we, we, in fact, there's, we often wish we could like, show the dysfunctional version of the video where a cat runs out of air, you know, <laughs> you're frustrated, you can't log on, that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, we, we, because we work with uh, technology that's not re yet, yet released, we encounter more problems than most people. Uh, and so, yeah, we live that pain every day. And, um, but it just, we, we feel that, so when we talk about our, our pillars, it's around bringing people, there's a fourth pillar I didn't talk about. So there's, there was the bringing people together, there's live smarter, make better decisions, and friction-free creativity, or, or just create, you know, create a flow. There's also peace of mind which means that you have to be able to trust the system you're, you're using. So security, privacy, ethical considerations, those are all foundational concepts. They're kind of boring to talk about in a video, um, but they're super important because no one's going to use these systems if you can't trust them. So yeah, we think a lot about that. Hi, David. Thank you for such a great presentation on illustrating how technology might benefit fit us in the future, but um, I kind of want to shift the conversation again to a more humanistic pr perspective. Um, and I was wondering if you could uh, comment on how our obsession with technology these days might affect our interpersonal relationship with other people, um, especially mm -hmm. considering nowadays that um, a lot of infants, a lot of children are being are grown up um, in the presence of a lot of technology as opposed to uh, human interaction. Yeah, there's a lot of concern about the effects of screens on developing brains, uh, and not necessarily the, the radiation from the screen. Some people think, oh no, we're getting you know, x-rays or something. But it's more the fact that uh, the games are so engaging, like you can watch kids who just keep watching YouTube videos and they go click, 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 just getting dopamine hits. And what does that do to a developing brain? And I think we found that you know, it's very hard for a student who's used to you know, getting all of these exciting things on video, then go to a class and listen to a teacher droning on for, for three hours. So it makes it more difficult to pay attention. So yeah, there's concerns around that. Uh, there's also concerns, you know, there's been a spike in sort of depression, anxiety, and suicide. I think suicide, I'm, I have to double check that number. That sort of correlates with social media usage uh, for young folks. And um, so there's concerns that yes, you know, people are spending too much time in digital relationships and not sort of developing the sort of, uh, face-to-face -face personal relationships. I also hear interesting stories from people like uh, Doug Rushkoff, 
who is a media professor at, in New York, who says the number of kids who show up in his classes every year with notes excusing them from participation because of anxiety issues is going up. Like, what's going on there? Um, I think for many of us who are older, who had you know decades of life without social media, maybe we, we've sort of we've learned those basic skills. But for people who get a cell phone before they have you know true high school friends, it maybe sets you down um, a different path of, of developing, you know understanding of how to have real human relationships. So yeah, I think we need to do more research in that. I think it's super important. Uh, hi, David. Hey. So in these videos that we saw, we saw uh, people who are educated being impacted by this in their workplace. We saw people uh, in their homes having these screens, these devices that probably improve their quality of life, their productivity, uh, and just making, this, I guess, their lives better. Uh, but also, these people are the people who, I guess, can afford these mm -hmm. different items. Uh, how do you see these large advances in AI improving quality of life for people who maybe can't afford that TV in their home? So, a great that's a common criticism we get. And again, this is these are targeted towards developed world. We often wish we could do one for a developing country. Um, but what we find though, when we go to developing countries, they have just the same technology that people have here, especially with mobile devices. And so the, 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 the digital divide is less about hardware and it's more about uh, learning how to use the hardware in many cases. Um, also, when you look at uh, the sort of the virtual reality ex or the, the augmented reality experiences coming with HoloLens, when that hardware drops down, it won't matter what infrastructure you have. You'll be able to put any size TV on any wall you want at any time. And so I see that becoming less of an issue uh, going forward uh, in terms of that type of divide. Um, in terms of your question, how does it benefit people in developing countries? Uh, there's a lot of really exciting work going on, especially when you look at sort of decentralized models to bring in like solar stations uh, and then TV white space radios that take advantage of spectrum between TV channels that provide low, uh, you know, high bandwidth connectivity to completely off-grid regions. And then with that, you get a cell phone and you also get some sort of bank account. And now people have an ability to transact business where they never had that before. You had, you, it was not safe to carry money. And so we're seeing a lot of sort of grassroots economic development happening on the back of these technologies. Uh, what's funny, as soon as they do this, the next thing they want is Netflix. That's like the next purchase, is everyone wants a big TV and a Netflix account. Um, but in addition to that, we're also, you know, we talked yesterday a little bit about uh, data dignity and how people could benefit from their data. We're looking at a pilot project, I think in Kenya, uh, working with farmers where they're selling their data about their crops in exchange for money. And so there's a lot of really interesting activity happening in developing countries. Um, Hope that answers your question. Yeah, so do you see this maybe the early adoption by the middle class, upper middle class, and then as it can become cheaper technology, more widely available, it'll propagate? So yes, but then again, keep in mind, we're not trying to predict that everyone's gonna have these screens. What we're trying to do here is show what's possible so we can have conversations about what technology should do. I don't think people would necessarily have some of these screens built into their homes. They're too, they're too expensive, they're too you know, unreliable. Um, this is, we're not trying to say everyone's gonna live this way. We're just really trying to support having the conversations about things like, hey, how can technology help us uh, feel closer to one another with distributed families? That sort of thing. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, David. Hey. Thanks again, as you know, I really enjoy your work. I wanna come back to this point that we were talking about earlier uh, around work. And you were saying how, in fact, what we really might want to do is change the structure of our work, our work week and our work life, maybe have a three-day weekend. And yet, we've seen more and more automation, and our work schedule hasn't changed. It hasn't gotten any better. And even in the video that you showed, uh, we see a lot of this. It looked like it was showing a lot of work and leisure time kind of merging into each other, where she's the young woman is out with her friends, and then she gets a message yeah. about work and kind of yeah. bikes away to go and immediately respond. And it's presented as this really happy, yeah. like ideal picture. So I wonder how are y'all thinking about that, that sort of tension between work and leisure? That's a great question. That's something we're focused on now is like, how do we enable people to turn technology off? Because when we went and did our consumer study, we realized like, hey, not everyone wants to be connected all the time. In fact, the more people are connected, the unhappier they are. And so, and yet so many of our, of the business models in, in society today are driven by keeping your eyes glued on the screen. And so we think that's fundamentally broken. 
Um, and so we're looking at ways that when, even the feed, you know, we showed that contextual feed where it's like, hey, here's the most important things to do. We even learned that we don't like that model because feeds are endless. There's always more to do. We're trying to get to a point where it's like, hey, here's the two things you should do today. And when you're done, put your phone away and go have fun. Uh, that's what we're trying to get to. And of course, that's very different from the way things are designed today. We don't have the answer yet, but that's what we're currently thinking about. Um, and as for the, the bracelet scene, yes, uh, I know we feel bad about that, but the idea was uh, we're trying to show that she had this digital assistant. Like, we, you know when she like flicked the, the, the pay the bill thing away, she was supposed to be upset, it didn't come across very well, but she really needs to pay a bill, she needs money. And Lola, so her assistant saying, hey, you need money, you should take this call, it's easy money. And so that's why she's like, hey guys, I gotta go take this. And uh, that's, that was the story. It didn't come across in the video, but that was our thinking that went into that. That, no, go have fun and don't worry. If something really important happens that needs your attention, we will let you know. Hi, David. Hey. Uh, thinking back to how speech recognition software, the development of that sped up dramatically after deep learning was the, uh, implemented, do you think that there is a technological or practical limit to how powerful this technology should be or could be? Speech recognition? Or just technology in general. Like, for example, if everybody reads or speaks at a 10th grade English level, is it practical to have a computer that is 100 times more powerful than a PhD English student? Mm. So maybe I'll talk about speech reco, see if this answers the question. I mean, so we're getting now into recognizing people with different accents and doing a better job with that. Because especially with international teams, you have people who, comp who it's very hard for computers to, to do that. Also, we're trying to recognize when people talk over one another. Actually, we can do pretty well at that, especially like four people talking simultaneously, we can disambiguate the voices. So a lot of the practical applications involve doing things that people do that you don't realize you do, that computers aren't good at doing yet. So there's still a lot of work to do to make these techno technologies robust in real world scenarios. So once it is as powerful as a human being, is that the end, or would you well, want to go past I don't know, that? then I, I guess what would happen is there's no longer an economic incentive to keep investing in it. When speech recognition is good enough and it just works, I mean, I think you'll have to constantly be on the lookout for new words and new speech patterns, but that can all be automated. Um, so yeah, maybe it just goes on autopilot at that point and we don't, we don't invest any more in it. I'm, I'm speculating, but it, unless there's, if there's no reason for it, it, it probably might be good enough. Very cool, thank you. Hey. hey, oh my goodness, hi. Hey. Um, so when I was watching your video, the thing that struck me the most was um, the part with the kids in the school and how they were interacting. Um, so nowadays, standardized testing is kind of the norm and I find that it puts um, kids into a box. I mean, they have to focus on memorization over actual learning. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, your video shows a revolutionized way of education where they can play to their strengths and they can, um, if they're visual learners, they can learn visually or if, if you know. So, um, my question is, is that with AI's reputation, do you, like, what are the challenges you think that you'll face if it's even possible to integrate technology like that into schooling instead of what's always been done, which is standardized testing? Good question. I think AI can be helpful in school in the sense that it can actually measure what's going on in the classroom and per perhaps collect data automatically for the teachers and allow them to spend more time working directly with the students. Um, yeah, we, we did put that scene in deliberately to sort of provoke the education industry to move more towards more project-based, curiosity-driven learning. And, and, and good news is we've actually had school boards use the video to launch their professional development programs. Uh, but you guys are doing exactly that as well in this course. You're sort of working together on small teams, cross-disciplinary, pursuing your own ideas, not a lot of structure with the, with the, the, the fellows and the, and the professors, you know, providing input to help, to help out. Um, was, did AI play a role in that? Or is it really, are we just getting back to where humans learn with humans? Well, you probably were pulling information at times, you know, searching for stuff or, so I mean, maybe that's the right way to think about it, is look at your own experience in this course, and then how do we replicate that at scale? Yeah, it's just a worry that um, there's always the mentality of like, this is what we've always done, um, why shouldn't we just continue with it? Because sometimes switching from something that is very familiar to something completely yeah. new 
is daunting, especially yeah. when it involves yeah. young kids that are the future. Yeah, it's hard to experiment on kids. Um, but I mean, what's, what's <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I think I told you guys there was, I saw this program with K through five education you based did. on robotics, which blew my mind. It actually was motivated by our video, I'm proud to say, because uh, it's in the same school district. But it was amazing to watch these kids just work together across language barriers, uh, iterating on these little simple, like move a ladybug down a road and eat a peanut or something. Uh, and then as it sort of progressively got more and more complex as they moved through their grades. Uh, but it worked really well. The, the thing that really stood out for me was how engaged the kids were. Like, it was amazed what they were learning, but they, I was like, wow, I wish I was a kid doing what they were doing because it looks so fun. And they were clearly totally into it. Um, so I think we're just gonna have to start experimenting and we're gonna have to take the successes that we see and, and share those learnings and, and more and more people will start uh, doing the thing that's working well that's different. And yes, there's gonna be some letting go of the things that we always did because they worked uh, in the industrial age, but they're not gonna work as well anymore going forward. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone, great questions. And I, I'm just here to give another formal thank you to David Jones who, up until last night, we knew David as a disembodied head on a screen. And so you're sort of like Lola in the video. So it's fantastic to get to meet you in person and see that you actually do exist as a real, no, you're not an AI construct. And uh, really just to thank you, uh, David, one of our two Jaroslowski fellows that really made the global engagement program possible. I'm um, speaking as a historian whose work sort of teeters between the past in every sense of old work methods and studying the past. It's really inspiring for me to see this and begin imagining, you know, how my work as a historian is gonna change, how the work of all of the different disciplines that came together in the Global Engagement Seminar are gonna change, and that we really need to have these sorts of envisionings really at the heart of programs like this and as a, of our society to help us understand the shape of education, life, and work in the 21st century. So thanks for all of your questions and engagement um, throughout this talk, and thanks again to David for his wonderful opening keynote of today. So at this point, I'd like to invite you all to join us out in the atrium. There is a coffee break. We'll take a short break. We're back here at uh, 2 for our next keynote by our next Jaroslowski Fellow. During the break, if you have coffee, you have treats, etc., if you want to continue to check out the wonderful student exhibitions, so just down that hallway, we have eight exhibits. Try to catch them all. It's going to be a lot of fun. So again, thanks, David, and thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon. So thank you. Thank you.